Again, welcome to the Watchdog Award Dinner presented jointly by the Center for Investigative Journalism, Freedom of Information Council, and a Society of Professional Journalists. Tonight is the night where we also recognize Wisconsin's distinguished watchdog, Raquel Rutledge. We are also excited to be recognizing the 2018 winners of the Opie Awards um, and formally issuing the awards tonight. Yes. And despite what you might hear on the national political scene, uh, tonight we can promise you treats and not tweets. <laughs> and after our brief remarks, we will be introducing Andy Hall, who is the executive director of the Center for Investigative Journalism. Now, um, April has some carefully prepared remarks she's put together, um, but what do you think? You know, what the heck? <laughs> <laughs> you know, those would have been a little boring. Well, they would have been a little boring and sad. That's right. Oh, okay. Well, unfortunately, we've just been informed that off-script remarks are only allowed for much higher uh, sponsorship packages. So um, with that, we're going to... Uh, we'll pass things over. We'll cede the microphone to Andy. Thank you all for coming tonight, and we're sure that you will enjoy the program. Thank you. Thank you, Krista and April. Um, and good evening to everybody uh, as we uh, start now the eighth annual uh, Wisconsin Watchdog Awards. Um, as they said, um, I'm uh, the executive director of the nonpartisan and nonprofit Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism. And behalf, on behalf of WCIJ's partners at the Wisconsin Freedom of Information Council and the Madison Pro Chapter of the, of the Society of Professional Journalists, thanks to all of you here in this room for all you do in promoting open government and investigative journalism. We appreciate the help, too, of the Wisconsin Newspaper Association and the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association and the UW-Madison School of Journalism and Mass Communication in selecting the winner of the Distinguished Wisconsin Watchdog Award. So everybody, welcome. Uh, it's going to be a grand evening. You made tonight's event a sellout again, and we appreciate the skillful work of the Madison Club staff in accommodating all of us as we're jammed into this space. Um, thank you, Madison Club. And congratulations uh, to all of the winners who will be recognized tonight with the FOIC's OPEs and to Raquel Rutledge, uh, the recipient of the Distinguished Wisconsin Watchdog Award. As we get started, I'd like to recognize the sponsors whose generosity has made this event possible. The lead sponsor this year is April Barker's law firm, Shots, Bublets, and Engel. Your generosity is deeply appreciated. Thank you. Other major sponsors include Betty and Corky Custer and the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association. Thank you. We're also grateful to the Goss Weber Mullins law firm, uh, Ralph Weber, uh, the Capital Times, the Wisconsin State Journal, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, uh, Pines Bach, uh, Chris's law firm, uh, the Edgerton Reporter, and there are lots of people from Edgerton here tonight. We uh, really appreciate all of their presence. Uh, Dick Record, uh, Madison Magazine, and Morgan Murphy Media, uh, as well as uh, Wagner CPAs. Uh, this evening wouldn't be possible without your generous support, so thanks to everybody. So this year, we're celebrating WCIJ's 10th year of operations. And tonight, it is great. We're pleased to publicly unveil uh, a video, which was generously produced by John Roach and his talented crew at Roach Video Production Service about the center. I'm going to step aside now while it runs for four minutes. Um, and if you happen to be seated along this wall, feel free to uh, stand up for the next four minutes, move out this way, or drag your chairs out, or whatever, if you want to take a look. It's a, it's a great piece of work. Many 
many newsrooms in Wisconsin and across the country have essentially become hollowed out. They've lost 30 to 40 percent of their reporting workforce. Investigative reporting takes a lot of time and money, a lot of investment. So what we do is we provide these stories for free to all of the editors of the state of Wisconsin and beyond. When I was at the Press Gazette, the center was just starting out and they did some really great work. It was timely, relevant, and um, hit on a lot of issues that were important to our readers. The newspaper had gone through three rounds of layoffs, so it really filled that gap for us. There are very few places today that do the same level of deep uh, investigative journalism on a local and state level as some of the big newspapers like the Washington Post where I work. And the local level is actually as important or more important. So the Center for Investigative Journalism is providing an incredibly important service. So far, uh, about 600 news organizations have used or cited our content. And our goal, of course, is to inform the citizenry and, and strengthen our democracy. We are not an advocacy organization. We're not trying to cater to one political party or the other. And, and that's part of how we keep our legitimacy. We have a marvelous relationship with the School of Journalism and Mass Communication, and the students really drive our projects forward. We also hire paid student interns whose offices are right here in Vilas Hall. They're right there out in the trenches doing the interviewing, analyzing the data, coming up uh, with our findings, accessing public records, holding powerful officials to account. You know, we're doing original reporting. We're not just getting quotes and filing the story. We're really talking to people, getting the data that we need to support whatever we're saying. The most important stories the center has done involve frac sand mining, whistleblowers, and the failure of the state to protect them, water quality issues. These are stories that are critically important to most of us, and they need to be told. And they involve no political bias at all. They're exceptional journalists. The work has won a lot of awards. Results are fantastic. They are leaders uh, that are looked to nationally by other journalism organizations. Dee and Andy are so generous with their time, and they really care about teaching the next generation of investigative reporters, and it's changed my life, and I'm, I'm just really happy to be a part of it. A typical investigation might take us two to three months. Last year, for example, in our failure to, uh, at the Fawcett Project, where we examined threats to Wisconsin's drinking water, we spent more than $60,000. We do not have a subscription. We have some other forms of revenue, but our largest are foundations and individual donations. People who fund our work have no voice in our editorial decisions, and we take great pride in protecting the integrity of the journalism. We are looking for things that other people don't want you to know. We investigate for regular people who don't have any way of figuring these things out on their own. We can't ever rest. We have to remain vigilant always uh, to make sure that the public remains knowledgeable about the actions of the people in power. Thanks to John uh, and his colleagues for helping WCIJ to, to share its story. We appreciate it, John. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that video um, opened with a powerful quote from Eduardo Galeano, a Uruguayan journalist who lived from 1940 uh, to 2015. I am grateful to journalism for waking me up to the realities of the world, Galeano said. That's exactly what we strive to do at WCIJ, and we seek to increase the quality, the quantity, and the understanding of investigative journalism while we train and inspire a new generation of investigative journalists who will carry that torch forward into the dark places of our society that need to be illuminated to inform the public and strengthen our democracy. I'd like to recognize WCIJ's excep exceptional staff uh, my wife, uh, D.J. Hall, uh, Lauren Furman, uh, Coburn Ducart, 
as well as our current uh, public engagement and marketing interns, uh, Emily Neinfeldt uh, and Katie Scheidt, uh, and our incoming investigative reporting interns, uh, Emily Hamer and Maddie Heim. Uh, they're actually covering the event uh, here tonight, so we'll, they'll be publishing their first byline soon. Um, also, uh, WCIJ's uh, legal counsel, uh, Krista Westerberg. Um, thanks, Krista. And our development consultants, uh, Gail Cole and Christopher Glick, uh, both of whom are here tonight. Um, thank you. <laughs> Great work. Uh, and our senior strategic advisor, Barbara Johnson, as well as several members of the WCIJ Board of Directors who are here tonight. Uh, President Karen Lincoln Michelle, uh, Vice President Brent Houston, uh, and members uh, Herman Bauman, uh, Malcolm Brett, uh, and, and Ralph, Ralph Weber. Um, and uh, we really appreciate all of their efforts to, to lead the organization. And of course, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, provide a special commendation uh, to Lauren and her team for expertly handling the many hundreds of details that made, made tonight's event such a success. So thank you, Lauren, and everybody. And then finally, uh, I'd like to recognize uh, the charter members of our new Watchdog Club, which is something that uh, we have formed uh, in recent months. Uh, these are our largest and most loyal donors who are investing in the sustainability of WCIJ. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, all the Watchdog Club members who are here tonight. Uh, for those of you who have a view of the screen, you can, you can see the names um, up here. Uh, and I'd like to ask the Watchdog club members who are here tonight uh, to please uh, stand. <laughs> Thanks to each and every one of you. Uh, well, we've had uh, quite a year. Um, we produced our first documentary, uh, Los Lecheros, uh, Dairy Farmers. It's a 21-minute film examining the rising tensions over undocumented workers in Wisconsin dairies since the election of President Trump. Uh, that film, which we produced in collaboration with Jim Crickey and Susan Peters of 12 Letter Films in New York, is now being screened at film festivals across the nation, uh, more than a dozen at last count. Um, soon it will make its broadcast premiere, um, and we're already discussing ideas for a new documentary, so stay, stay tuned on that. Um, we're really excited about the future of documentary production uh, to further tell uh, investigative stories in Wisconsin. Last year, our stories were picked up or mentioned uh, more than 645 times by other media organizations, um, and they appeared uh, 106 times on the front pages of newspapers uh, to reach an estimated audience of 5.6 million people. Uh, we're very, very uh, proud of that and, and very grateful uh, to the many media, or media organizations uh, that have uh, worked with us uh, by picking up or using the content uh, for print or broadcast or online. Um, and special recognition to our friends from Wisconsin Public Radio who are hidden back here in the alcove. Uh, thanks very much uh, for the collaboration uh, through the fellowship and all the news coverage. Uh, the center's aggressive reporting on lead in drinking water prompted a bipartisan bill signed by Governor Scott Walker to make it possible for utilities to replace dangerous aging lead pipes. Our story about the quiet repeal of the State False Claims Act has led to the introduction of a bill that would reinstate this powerful tool for rooting out fraud in the $9 billion a year Medicaid program. Uh, in the past year, we won a first place national investigative reporting award from the Society of Professional Journalists for our failure at the Fawcett series. And uh, thank you. <laughs> 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 and um, we were also named a winner uh, recently of uh, 14 prizes in the Milwaukee Press Club uh, Excellence in Journalism Contest. Last week, we accepted the top award, a golden gavel from the State Bar of Wisconsin for our coverage of the use of flawed forensics in criminal cases. Um, in the coming year, uh, we promise more fact-checked, high-impact investigations, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll be investigating a wide range of issues, including um, the state of our democracy in Wisconsin. Uh, 
and, and the many pressures and threats uh, that it faces as citizens try to uh, keep up uh, with the actions uh, of our government. If you would like to keep up with our work uh, or become a donor, we make it easy. Just visit us at wisconsinwatch.org uh, and make a gift or sign up for our newsletters, uh, which are published um, at least once a week. Uh, the center's more than 30 former interns continue to produce stellar work here in Wisconsin and around the globe. Uh, sponsorships and donations uh, support tonight's event and the work of WCIJ, and they also made it possible earlier this afternoon for more than 30 high school and college journalists, as well as working journalists from around Wisconsin, to attend an investigative reporting workshop uh, just down the hall. Uh, it was a great event, and um, many uh, of those young people who attended that event uh, are here tonight. Um, and I'd like to ask uh, them to stand up, the, the folks, uh, the students and young journalists from places like uh, the Simpson Street Free Press, uh, UW-Madison, Madison College, UW-Milwaukee, uh, and elsewhere, please stand and accept our gratitude for your commitment to truth-telling. Uh, you represent the future of our democracy and investigative journalism. Thanks to all of you. In closing, uh, we're determined to use WCIJ uh, as an instrument of truth to reveal the most profound possible truths that power and secrecy have blocked the public from knowing. We're committed to telling uncovered and undercovered stories that, as our guiding principles declare, and as you saw in the video, protect the vulnerable, expose wrongdoing, and explore solutions. We want to help restore faith in our democracy. Thank you for believing. Thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Mark Pitch, Assistant City Editor at the Wisconsin State Journal and President of the Madison Pro Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Andy. Um, it was about eight years ago that <clears throat> myself and a small group of journalists uh, gathered together to try and revive our local chapter, the Society of Professional Journalists. Uh, it was time that we figured to reclaim journalism from some of the critics and the naysayers. Uh, we were, felt a little pushed around and beat up by people who were cheering our impending demise. Uh, it felt personal. You know, I've been in this profession for most of the last 30 years. I started a newspaper in eighth grade. And for, and for those of you who've heard this story, forgive me. When I was about five years old, my mother brought me, bought me a special brush to clean my elbows. Because I'd put the paper on the floor, lay on top of it, and prop myself up, head in my hands. I'd get newsprint all over the elbows. So, I, you know, and I still remember from my youth the names of some of those reporters, photographers, and editors from the Lacrosse Tribune. Grant Blum, Gata Hallnagel, Jim Burgess, Jackie Kaiser, Terry Rindfleisch, Dick Rineker. So those of us who revived SPJ Madison wanted to promote journalism, we wanted to promote journalists. We wanted to stand up for the First Amendment and the public's right to know how its government works. We wanted to help the pub public understand what we do. We printed up I'm a journalist buttons, like the kind I'm wearing tonight, and distributed them across the area to our wide tent of journalists, from the Wisconsin State Journal and the Capital Times to the Simpson Street Free Press, from WORT and the Progressive to the former Wisconsin Reporter. We've been so popular, we ran out of about 1,000. I think the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism was thinking about the same thing at, at, at about the same time, and we're now uh, proud to be co-presenters of this event, uh, and every year I walk away reinvigorated about the robust journalism enterprise we have here in Madison and across Wisconsin. And now it seems every day more and more people, not just journalists, are talking about the importance of journalism. Sometimes I wonder, hey, where were you 10 years ago? Um, but mostly, I'm, I'm really happy about this renewed attention to credible journalism. Uh, later tonight, you're going to hear about some 
excellent examples of journalism produced in Wisconsin over the past year. I'd like to highlight a few others. Because of the Wisconsin Rapids Daily Tribune, we learned about a school, local school superintendent who received a raise just before she retired, boosting her taxpayer-funded retirement. Thanks, Jonathan Anderson. WITI in Milwaukee sought to obtain records about how much time the county sheriff was spending doing his job. They were blocked for seven months and eventually received the sheriff's calendars for 90 of the 640 days that they sought them. Thanks, the O'Keefe. More great reporting on the use or misuse of taxpayer funding came from the Lake, Lakeland Times, the Lake County Reporter, the La Crosse Tribune, and the Sun Prairie Star. WEAU and Eau Claire uncovered a gap in 911 systems locating users calling on cell phones. Thanks, Amanda Tyler. And over in Crawford County, the Independent illustrated how local land use zoning uh, and choices may have contributed to devastating floods in that area. Thank you, Jillian Pomplin and Charlie Pricer. I want to applaud this work and all the great reporting in Wisconsin over the past year. Every year, it seems there's no shortage of it. I'd like to highlight just a couple of things that SBJ Madison did in the last year. Thanks to the generosity of Madison area journalism uh, journalists, we raised $1,200 for student newspapers at UW-Madison, the Daily Cardinal and the Badger Herald. Over the last four years, Madison area journalists have raised nearly $4,000 for middle school, high school, and college journalists. We awarded our second John Patrick Hunter First Amendment Award for the best high school and college student journalism on the important principles of free speech, religion, and assembly. We thank the Wisconsin Newspaper Association for partnering with us on this award, which we hope will help young journalists better understand and appreciate the First Amendment. Uh, this year, the award went to Emily Hamer of the Badger Herald for her very nuanced reporting of free speech issues on the UW campus. Is Emily here? Hey. Appreciate that, that was a terrific story. Uh, we also hosted uh, training on using science and journalism. The natural world is changing and, and it's important to use fact-based information uh, in our work. So I started this talk noting that SB Madison was relaunched about eight years ago. Our chapter is now about 20 years old, give or take. As and Andy mentioned, WCIJ is celebrating its 10th year this year and the FOIC is also uh, reaching a big milestone that I'm sure you'll hear about. So those are all big accomplishments. I'm sure you'll hear more about them as the year rolls on. Thank you, and I'd like to introduce Bill Leaders, President of the Wisconsin Freedom of Information Council. I'd like to begin by noting the recent passing of Peg Laudenschlager, who was Wisconsin's Attorney General from 2003 to 2007. While every person who has held that job in recent years has worked to defend open government, Peg Laudenschlager was a fighter. She sued to force a local economic development commission to abide by the state's openness laws. She backed a lawsuit that established the obligation of public bodies to provide specific meeting notices. She challenged secrecy in the state's bill drafting process and even sued a state lawmaker for foot dragging on an open records request. There are two ways to honor those who have died, with silence and with applause. I think in Peg's case, we should opt for the applause. A while back, I was on the Devil's Advocate radio show and the, to discuss an open records issue, and the host asked me ahead of time if I wanted a musical introduction. Now, nobody had ever asked me that before, but <laughs> I answered right away. The theme from the West Wing. It just seemed perfect for talking about open government. So if you don't mind. I'm not going to be upstaged by a John Roach video.
Wisconsin's tradition of open government is a big part of what makes our state great. Reporters and others use our open records and open meetings laws to break stories and ensure accountability. We will be honoring some of them in just a moment. But in fact, transparency benefits not just the governed, but also those who govern, for the most part, honorably. It is in everybody's interest to protect the notion etched into our laws that all persons are entitled to the greatest possible information regarding the affairs of government and the official acts of the officers and employees who represent them. <laughs> but of course, last year, like every year, we have seen attacks on that tradition and the actual erosion of access. I have music for this part, too. That's something I found by Googling political attack ad. Over the last year, we've seen public officials in places like Sauk County seek to conceal information and limit public input. That voiceover is because I didn't pay for it. We've lost access to files of dismissed cases from the state's online court record system because of concerns that the public cannot be trusted with this information. The Wisconsin Supreme Court recently affirmed a records denial based on unsubstantiated speculation about how the records might be used. State, law, state lawmakers very nearly passed a bill to shut down public access to most video from police body cameras. Call your state or local officials. Tell them that you want government to operate as openly as possible because it is our right, hold on, because it is our right to know what our government is up to and it is our obligation to preserve that right into the future for the sake of our democracy. This we do because sunshine is the best disinfectant. Actually, I'm not sure that's true. I'd hate to have a surgeon who thought that. This we do because access to information is something we deserve, even if it gives us gangrene. Thank you, America. Now the Opies. <laughs> Let's get our first and only negative award out of the way. This year, lawmakers from both parties withheld critical information about sexual harassment investigations and refused to provide electronic records in electronic form. The Republican majority held secret meetings to hash out budget details and selectively blocked access to their social media accounts. The No Friend of Openness Award, or NOPI, goes to the Wisconsin Legislature. We invited the Senate Majority Leader and the Speaker of the Assembly to attend. Did I didn't say whatever they wanted, but they did not respond. I brought their award again as the last year in the shittiest frame I could find. It doesn't even have glass. It's 69 cents from Goodwill. Over the last year, as a reporter for the Baraboo News Republic, Tim Damus broke multiple stories exposing the lack of transparency favored by officials in Sauk County. Some involved a former administrator who received a $135,000 contract buyout. Some involved the county's former highway commissioner who solicited NASCAR tickets from a contractor. Damus's paper, based on his reporting, has filed a lawsuit and lodged a complaint alleging additional violations. The Media Openness Award, or MOPI, goes to Tim Damos. Need that West Wing music back here. <laughs> well, I want to thank the Freedom of Information Council for this recognition and for being such a tremendous uh, force for open government in Wisconsin. Um, thank you to the other organizers of this event who do so much to promote newspapers and journalism. Uh, the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, the Wisconsin Pro Chapter, Wisconsin Pro Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists, the Wisconsin Newspaper Association, and the UW-Madison School of Journalism and Mass Communication. Your work is important and appreciated. 
I want to thank my dad, Jim, my sister, Jenny, and my girlfriend, Leah, for being here, uh, supporting me tonight and helping me celebrate. And I want to thank my mom, Linda, who uh, used to read the newspaper front to back every day. And she's the person who sparked my interest in journalism. And I know she would want to be here if she could. Um, in terms of openness, there's always going to be a, a sort of a tug of war between government officials and the press. And I think that's natural. Um, I've spent more than a decade pulling at one end of that rope. And it can be challenging and it can be very uncomfortable. Um, I assume the same is true for those at the other end. But this tug of war is necessary because everyone can agree that a healthy democracy depends on government providing as much tra transparency as possible. And we only get that if there are people at this end of the rope who never stop pulling. So congratulations to the other award winners here tonight on your much deserved recognition. Uh, thank you for what you've done to further the cause of open government and I encourage you all to keep pulling. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Tim. Tim's a great reporter. Joe Terry, a former village administrator for Port Edwards, spent countless hours documenting open meetings and ethics violations by the village board. His complaint to the Wood County District Attorney led to the appointment of a special prosecutor and ultimately to a settlement requiring some officials to receive training on the state's openness laws. The Citizen Openness Award, or COPE, goes to Joe Terry. Thank you. I'm humbled to have been nominated and to receive this award. When I saw local government activity that I perceived as inappropriate, I validated those concerns by research through public records request and submitted a complaint to the district attorney. What I found was elected officials in the municipality where I live were conducting illegal meetings, were taking actions outside their legal authority, and were violating their own ethics ordinances. I was especially concerned because these officials had received specific training on these matters through the League of Wisconsin Municipalities, yet chose to continue their inappropriate behavior. When I submitted my complaint to the DA, he found my information accurate and determined their activities constituted actionable offenses. It took about a year for the determination, and you can imagine my disappointment when the action against the violators equated to some additional training. The government officials who knowingly and willingly violated the law were not held individually accountable. The hero that saved the day was our local newspaper reporter, Karen Mann, and her editors who published several articles about these activities. Our local newspaper was able to do something that I wasn't, inform the public about what was going on. The articles generated interest, and the public reacted. All but two of the elected officials either resigned or didn't run for re-election. And the previous village president suffered a landslide loss at the polls, being outvoted by a 10 to 1 margin. It is because of the free press and reporters like Karen Madden that the public is informed about important local news. Change happened not because of my efforts or corrective action by the DA, but because the public was informed and would not tolerate corruption. I'd like to dedicate this award to, to Karen Madden and to all of you who work hard to report good, honest news. Thank you. In March of 2017, Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker issued an executive order directing state agencies to improve their performance on records requests. It called for quicker response times, 
limits on fees, and it required regular training, and it has made a positive difference. The Political Openness Award, or POPI, goes to Governor Scott Walker. Accepting the award is the governor's longtime spokesman, Tom Evenson. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the governor, thank you to the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, the Society of Professional Journalists, and the uh, Wisconsin Freedom of Information Council um, for this, uh, this outstanding award. Um, as someone who has worked for the governor for a long time and as his communications director, I have to honestly say that's something I thought I'd never say. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, the governor has, over the last several years, made a concerted effort uh, to increase transparency and openness across state government. Uh, we now have an online website where reporting times and uh, the amount of uh, public records requests that we receive are published online. Uh, we, as Bill said, we've reduced fees and standardized that process, and it's something that uh, we're passionate about, especially our chief legal counsel, who is uh, Katie Gnatowski, who is our custodian of uh, public records. And we're proud of the fact that since 2011, uh, the governor's office alone has released more than six million pages of records. Uh, and as someone from the other end of the rope, uh, I can say that it is an arduous process, uh, but a necessary one. And uh, it's a necessary one because, as we've all talked about tonight, uh, citizens deserve to know what's going on in their government. So thank you very much. You guys didn't do an executive order this year, though. <laughs> Next year, you're going to have to make it up if you're, if you're still around. Um, digging into a belatedly urgent issue, Wisconsin State Journal reporter Molly Beck reported on sexual harassment complaints against lawmakers, while her former colleague, Nico Savage, pulled back the veil on a UW-Madison professor with multiple complaints. Meanwhile, the UW, Madison, the UW Milwaukee, excuse me, student journalist at Media Milwaukee unearthed dozens of allegations of harassment involving professors and other staff. The award for Open Records Scoop of the Year, or Scoopy, goes to the Wisconsin State Journal and Media Milwaukee. Accepting the award for the Wisconsin State Journal is Molly Beck. Thank you so much for this award, and thank you everybody for recognizing journalists every year for their work. Um, right after I moved to the Capitol Beat a few years ago, I covered uh, what you probably all remember, the effort by the legislature to make private many records that they made. And I think if that had been successful, the story that um, you guys have given me and my colleagues an award for wouldn't be possible. Um, without the state's records law and without a brave woman who agreed to share their story with us, stories like these don't happen. So thank you for highlighting why our state's records law is important, and thank you to my editors at the State Journal who always give me time and sometimes spend a lot of money <laughs> to utilize the records law on behalf of readers and taxpayers. Thank you. We have two reporters from uh, Media Milwaukee here today, Talis Shelburne and Jennifer Rick. Uh, accepting the award is Talis Shelburne. Okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so it's really special to be here. And uh, I want to thank my family, and um, Jennifer, respectively, <laughs> her family <laughs> as well, um, our journalism department staff at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and specifically um, my mentor and Professor Jessica McBride, who has been so exceptionally supportive during this time. She acts as our editor, and she has really pushed us to um, go for the pursuit of transparency. 
Our series on sexual harassment also can have been accomplished without my partner, Jennifer Rick, um, who first discovered the story at a campus meeting, a very innocuous campus meeting where we found out there was a policy change. And she had the instincts to dig deeper. She's been the best partner I could have asked for, so thanks, Jennifer. Um, when, when we first started the story in November, I had never ever requested a FOIA before. And it was in November of 2017 that I wrote my first open records request. And since then, we have blossomed so much as students, as people, and as journalists. So it's with gratitude and um, a continued focus on our pursuit for transparency that we accept this award. And we thank you all for putting this event on and inviting us. So is Will Kramer here? Oh, there you are. We didn't meet beforehand, I just want to make sure. Our final award does go to Will Kramer, an industry consultant who refused to keep quiet about the dangers posed by industrial barrel recycling plants in Milwaukee. He secretly recorded one plant manager remarking that the barrels, quote, could blow up and kill eight people in a heartbeat. When government regulators failed to act, he went to the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel spurring that paper's remarkable burned investigation, which led to significant fines and safety improvements. The award for Whistleblower of the Year, or Whoopi, goes to Will Kramer. Uh, thank you so much. Something that strikes me about everyone who's got an award tonight and everyone who's been mentioned and really from what I can tell everyone in this room is that you're people who don't give up in face of overwhelming opposition. Um, it's something I had to go through, but with, there's always gonna be people like me that, that have a story to tell. Um, but without reporters like, like Raquel, um, John, and Rick, um, with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, without um, all of you who do this kind of work, um, for I, I'm sure not nearly enough uh, money and um, not enough respect. Um, we have nothing left. The, the, you know, the community safety, um, the democracy itself of our country um, won't survive without the kind of work that you do and the people here who support it financially, um, this work. So thank you all so much. Um, thank, thank you to Heather, my wife, who's put up with um, this. <laughs> Got a very hard decision that our, our family had to go through and our, our boys, um, my parents and my, my brother are, are here tonight. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, Mr. Evanson, I, I hope you'll pass along to the governor that there's a lot more um, in this situation than others that, that the laws need to be enforced um, with this situation and, and other environmental crimes in Wisconsin. Um, but, and one, one thing, the last thing I'll say is that um, there's, a, there's a citizen task force that has grown up um, in St. Francis, Wisconsin, around um, where one of these facilities is um, because of the work of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Um, they asked me to, to pass along. They're so grateful to Raquel, John, Rick, um, and everyone for bringing this issue to their attention. They say they will not rest until this company is in compliance or shut down. Um, thank you again so much. Thanks to all our winners. Thanks to Governor Walker. I, we really do appreciate his advocacy on this issue. Uh, I um, now to present this year's Distinguished Wisconsin Watchdog Award is Greg Borowski of the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my job tonight is to introduce Raquel Rutledge. Uh, I had the good fortune in recent years of introducing two other winners of this award, Dave Amhafer and Meg Kissinger, who are also part of our watchdog team. Uh, in both cases, I could offer variations of the same joke, which was that our careers in Milwaukee began at the same time, only mine was as a newspaper carrier, and they were reporters, and therefore that made them very distinguished. Okay. Now I'm introducing someone who was hired after me at the Journal Sentinel, and who's younger than me, and I must say, Raquel, you don't look all that distinguished. <laughs> <laughs> so in 
So I considered uh, revoking the nomination letter, but Andy here said that I had to come up and find a few nice things to say about Raquel. And truth be told, it's not hard to find nice things to say about Raquel. Um, I started my job as watchdog editor in the middle of 2009 when Raquel was working on this little project called Cashing In on Kids. And at that point, I quickly learned what made Raquel so successful. First, she's determined. She's willing to do the hard work of reporting, be it developing sources, mining data, digging through documents, or staking out buildings. Some journalists want to shortcut the reporting to get more quickly to the writing and the byline reward, not Raquel. She is meticulous. Raquel will read every document, seek out every study, make every phone call. If a question comes up in the editing process, she can always find the answer. If not in her notes, then sometimes it's in one of the approximately 5,689 tabs that are open on her computer screen <laughs> at a given moment. You know, Put it this way, I would never want to have Raquel investigating me. Okay? Raquel is committed. She's committed to the story, to the craft, and to the community. This came through when we were wrestling with broad issues and themes, or doing a line-by-line -line look at the story, evaluating every sentence, every word for accuracy and context. And she often shares that knowledge with young journalists and the whole next generation. She's thoughtful. She sweats over whether everything is portrayed fairly, whether the findings play to stereotypes, whether a sentence, however accurate, leaves a false impression for the readers. She's gracious. In a newsroom full of the requisite egos, Raquel was genuinely, genuinely surprised as award after award, after award, after award, <laughs> came her way. Um, as I think about it, her resume reads sort of like the name of a law firm. Goldsmith, Polk, Loeb, and that other partner, Pulitzer. <laughs> Now, I must say, as her biased editor, that this week I thought it would have been, should have been, Goldsmith, Polk, Loeb, Pulitzer, and Pulitzer, but we can't have everything. Um, I feel like I have to mention these awards because I'm quite certain that Raquel is not going to mention them when she gets up here to talk. She is much more focused on results. The money saved, the people jailed, the reforms prompted, the difference her stories make for the people in our state. Her work has prompted the ATF to shut down it's undercover stings that were ensnaring the developmentally disabled. It forced the FDA to issue warnings to coffee roasteries where workers face devastating lung injuries. It helped shut down a baby wipe company that was selling contaminated products, led to fines against a barrel recycling company that was harming workers, and exposed how tourists are being victimized by alcohol-related blackouts in Mexico. Don't worry, she's still working on that one. But if I know Raquel, she's already thinking more about what's next, what's the next story. You see, after many years of working together, reporters and editors kind of develop this ability to know what the other person is thinking. So I'm looking at her right now, and she's thinking, Greg, I think it's time to start, no, stop talking already. <laughs> OK, see, and again, she's right. So my congratulations to Raquel, who's a very worthy recipient of our distinguished award tonight. Okay, so Greg is right. Uh, I've been called a lot of things in my life, but I don't think distinguished is ever one of them. Um, I hope it doesn't impact how I have to behave. <laughs> that would definitely put a uh, damper on my style. Um, so Peggy Lautenschlager, a quick story uh, about her, a huge public apology to her right now. Um, when I first started working at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel in 2004, I had come from Colorado, I'd been there for a long time, and wasn't uh, keeping up too much with what was going on in Milwaukee at that time. And I got thrown into a story, and I had to write about Peggy Lautenschlager, and my focus was Lautenschlager. Lautenschlager, I gotta spell that right. How do I spell that? I gotta make sure I don't make a mistake and get Lautenschlager. So I wrote the story, and at about eight o'clock at night, I got a call from the copy desk, and they said, you mean Peggy Lautenschlager, right? And I said, yeah. I said, yes, I do. You wrote Pat Lautenschlager. <laughs> what? How, how do you miss that? It's cr 
Crazy. Insane. Anyway, the copy desk, thank God for the copy desk. Ugh, they've saved my ass so many times I can't tell you. Uh, but I do want to say thank you, um, as everyone else has said, to all the organiz organizers of this uh, event, the Wisconsin Center for Investigative Journalism, and D&D, uh, the SPJ, and the Wisconsin Freedom of Information Council at Madison, UW-Madison, all the people that br brought this together. Um, it's wonderful to celebrate this stuff. And we don't often, you know, we don't like to, at least I don't like to, um, celebrate all the things we do and brag about them all the time, but I think it's really... Um, it is extremely important that the world does know what we do and, and our importance. And um, these things, these stories that we do, um, Will greatly underestimated um, his role in, in what we do and how these things happen because none of these stories get told if we don't have courageous people coming forward. And, you know, Will said everybody has a story to tell. Let me tell you this people don't want to tell their stories all the time or they're too scared to tell them. There are very few people that have the courage to do what Will and his family decided to do, and it makes all the difference in the world. So uh, thank you so much to you. I can't, I can't say you how, tell you how much um, it means to the, to the world. It makes, it makes a huge difference. Um, I hear so many times people come up to me and they'll say, why don't you write about such and such? Uh, or why don't you tell, you know, you should really do this story. And, and I want to say, and I do say actually, um, you should really, you know, tell me all about it and give me the documents and come forward and be willing to, to do that. And, you know, it just doesn't happen. Very few people do it. And I've been fortunate enough to have a few of those folks um, come my way. And, and I'll tell you, I think some of the time it's just luck what brings people our way. Whistleblowers that want to talk to us, sometimes it is luck. Um, other times I think they seek out our work and they trust from what they've read that we're, we're going to treat them um, with respect and protection. And all these organizations that I just mentioned earlier, um, you guys were in a big battle um, not too long ago, a number of years back to, to enact to help the shield law get passed in Wisconsin that made it possible for us to feel like we could have some protection um, for our sources. So that was huge. Um, and we continue to use that. Um, we try to treat our whistleblower sources as best we can and keep them informed when we're going to be um, notifying folks that they've, they've kind of, they've um, exposed. Um, with Will, we, um, Will came to us kind of early. He wasn't ready to tell his story just yet. Uh, and so we're respectful of that. And then, and we tried to keep him informed along the way when we were going to call somebody that he was calling out. Um, and I think, hopefully Will would say we, we did a decent job doing that. I think the one thing Will would say uh, is that he wished that we could have write, or we could have written and, and published a little bit faster. Um, he was eager to get, once he was ready to go, he was ready to have that story told. And um, I was in kind of a slow moving, I mean, it's just this, all the material. He had 16 hours of recordings of, of people inside, the, um, inside these plants talking about some of the dangers. But I felt pressure to write this story quickly because we knew these workers were uh, at really at risk and the neighborhoods were at risk. Explosions could happen any minute. People were getting chemical burns. I mean, they were these barrels were exploding and were were uh, um, bubbling up and burning people, and all these terrible things were happening. So we wanted to write this, but I'll tell you a quick little story. Um, Will probably doesn't even know this, but during this writing of this story, um, I had three kidney surgeries. Not a big deal. I have. I'm fine. No problem. It's all good. <laughs> but I had been I had been under this general anesthesia for like three times in three months, and my brain was foggy. I don't even know if George really knows that, but I couldn't write. Like, I was I really sat at my desk and I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know if I can actually tell this story. I don't think I can ever write a story again. I think I'm done. I just can't do it. And and it was really stressful, but um, but I had this. I knew I had to do it. So I stayed up till the wee hours, a number of nights in a row, and finally I got what I thought was a, you know a decent story to tell. And I remember. Um, it was, it was the close of day. George was walking out of the office. He had some dinner to go to. And I said, I think I got it. And I, and, and I grabbed him and I said, come here, sit down. And I made him sit down. He's walking up. But I said, sit down. Let me just read this to you. Um, and my kids know that I do that to my children too. I'm like, sit. I'm going to read, listen to my story. And, and tell me what's wrong with it. And so they roll their eyes and they'll put up with me a little bit. But um, anyway, I made George sit down and listen to my story. I read it slowly. And I think he was kind of like, I got to go to dinner. But um, here it is. And um, I just read like the first half, not even the first half, probably the first third of it. And then I was just quiet. And he sat there for a second. 
And then, I don't even know if he remembers this, but he hit his table and he said, yes! And he got up and he hugged me and he was like, you got it! And he got it. And it was so exciting to be able to, to be able to bring that together and to tell it. And I say that because that just speaks a little bit to the environment in our newsroom, which is very supportive. We are like family. We really are, and I know people use that as a cliche, but that is what it takes to, when we collaborate like that, there's, there's nothing we can't do together when we're on the same page. And Greg spoke of it too. We read each other's minds all the time. Uh, when I travel, every time I'm getting to get on the plane, um, Greg will text me, safe travels. I mean, what editor does that? Safe travels? I, mean, I love that. I mean, it's just so personal. So it's just attention to detail. It makes you feel valued. Um, we are very much like family. So speaking of family, um, over there, nothing could happen without the people at that table right there. Um, my mom, one of my dads, I have two dads. There's one of them right there. Um, those guys uh, have helped me. I live, they live a mile away from me. So throughout all my work, whenever I need something, get, can you get the kids? Can you, can you drive somebody somewhere? Um, I'm working late. Can you do it? They pick it up all the time. And then, um, as I said, my, the kids, my two boys right there, um, they put up with a lot. They put up a lot of me questioning everything all the time. <laughs> ah, and they just have got to be so sick of that. But they are very patient and generous. Um, and then, of course, my husband, John, who um, Will mentioned as well, um, he picked up the Burn series. In the middle of the series, um, I started getting calls or I started getting onto this other story about Mexico and some of the things that are happening to travelers to Mexico. John jumped in there. And he, but the beautiful part is like he, he'd already been listening to me ramble on and on and always and all the details. So he knew so much about it. He could jump right in. There's nobody else I'd want to share that story with. Um, and he's always so supportive of everything all the time. So uh, I couldn't do any of it without those guys. So I don't want to ramble on and on, but I wanted to just say a couple more quick things, a couple um, calls to action. We talk a lot, we've heard a lot said tonight about democracy and the importance that we um, that we keep telling our stories so that people understand the importance demo to democracy. I think a lot of times we're very general in those terms. We say democracy. But I think when we're telling this stuff, we need to spell out, kind of like we heard earlier tonight when you talk about all the important stories that we do, um, we need to make it very clear why the public needs us. And um, I'll just give you a quick example. This is probably going to make George mad, but I'm going to say it anyway because it is really important. We have, when we're cutting and when, we're, when, when our newsrooms are shrinking and people are losing their jobs and we want to tell the story about, you know, oh, 30 people just got laid off at the Denver Post, okay? That is awful. Um, that's not, you know, that's very sad and grim. What we need to be saying, though, is, you know, look, all these business, businesses everywhere shrink, right? They, they all constrict. People get laid off. It's awful. People don't care unless you tell them why they need to care. We need to be very clear about why they need to care about those particular jobs and not to be sanctimonious it does it does impact journal it does impact our democracy and so um i mean one of the things that i was thinking about is you know just in archives i tried to pull up i tried to pull up um, a story from 2004 that i wrote in fact about um some madison um lawyers they were from and they, they're in the news again because one of them's getting an award and they were accused of rape back in 2005 i think it was anyway tried to pull up the story and the link is dead because the servers you know they're not being paid for. So the chronicles of humanity being wiped away because we don't want to pay for servers. George has made the big fight and he has done a successful job in making sure that lots of our archives are intact. But listen, I'll tell you, papers across the country don't have their archives being maintained digitally and that is criminal in my opinion. So I'm always the dark cloud in the room, but um, <laughs> uh, I'm going to leave you just real quick with this, and that is that we, it's a really important time uh, in, as it always, I guess all times are important when it comes to journalism, but it was awesome to see the impact that we can have. And when you look at, um, when you look at the harassed stuff from the New York Times and the New Yorker, I mean, that, look at how it's changed our world. It's amazing what, how transformative that type of reporting can be. We can do it. It matters. I, I can't tell you how many thank yous I've gotten from the Mexico stuff. I've never gotten as many. Um, people saying, thank you for saving lives. Thank you for bringing this to light. It matters, and we appreciate it. So it's, it's, we can do it. We should do it. And um, you guys, I'm really excited that we're all in it together. So thank you so much for listening to me.
Thank you, every, everyone, again, for coming. I look forward to this event so much, listening to all the inspiring stories every year. And I also want to thank um, everyone for their support and also kind of an unsung hero. Uh, I want to thank Bill um, as a member of the FOIC board and also on the uh, OP selection committee, uh, which I, uh, along with Krista and others, was privileged to be on. Um, Bill does a tremendous amount of work pulling together all the nominations and shepherding us through that process, um, helping to foster the debate and resolve uh, disputes, and ultimately make the presentation of the awards something that, again, I really look forward to every year. So thank you, Bill. <laughs> And um, I apologize, I'm not a, a techie like Bill, but uh, <laughs> if I can make this work, and I apologize if it cuts out, um, I want to piggyback off of his uh, musical theme. And again, I, my equipment is not nearly as sophisticated. We'll see if this works. So thank you. Thank you for being our Superman Bill <laughs> on this event. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yep. So that's a wrap. Thanks everybody very much and we'll see you next year. <laughs>